And so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about this morning, about baptism. But I wanted to, um, first I wanted to start off in Romans chapter 10. <laughs> and the verses that I wanted to go is, is all the way from verse 1 all the way through verse 17. And so I wanted to, to read a little bit of that and talk about it. I, I didn't want to start off in baptism, though. I kind of wanted to just tell, I guess you would say, the whole story, maybe, uh, for to, to let y'all know kind of how I, I see water baptism from the scriptures. And so starting first off in verses 1 through 4, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church of Rome. And, you know, in chapters uh, 9... When it comes to the book of Romans, I always used to like to do this a lot, talk about an outline for the book of Romans. In, in Romans chapters 1 through 3, uh, really up until about verse 21, it, Paul explains that all men are guilty before God. He explains first, really in chapters 1, really mostly in chapter 1, that the Gentile is guilty. Uh, I used the word heathen the other day around somebody, and they were like, Dad, that, that word is, well, I, I just mentioned that word right there. Like, Dad, that, do you have to use that word in reference to that particular person? Um, it just sounds so derogatory. And I'm like, well, hold on a second. I just broke it down for the church the other day. The word heathen simply means unbeliever. It's either real or it's not. See, the, in the Old Testament, when, when God said the heathen, he was talking about the Gentile nations. What it, what it, it is what it is. They don't know the Lord. They haven't given their heart to God. They haven't been born again from the dead. Therefore, they are, that's what they're known as. So, what, what, anyway, I, I, in, in chapter 1, all men are guilty. The Gentile men, people are guilty. The heathen is guilty. The, the one who doesn't know the Lord is guilty. And then in chapters 2 and really up until about 321, he explains the Jew is guilty. Because, see, the Jew was looking to his own righteousness. He, the Jewish man, he, he represents really the self-righteousness that comes into the heart of man. Whenever, and it happens not just to the Jewish person, but in many times it happens to the Christian. After he gives his life to God, after he starts to go to church, he starts to look at what he is now compared to what he used to be. And he starts to see himself as someone who, who's arrived or, or, you know, I'm not what I used to be. Or he compares himself to someone else in the church and he sees that he's doing better than them. And he thinks that that, ha but that none of that is righteousness, Amen. at least not in, yeah. it's, it's self-righteousness. And, and in the eyes of God, that kind of righteousness won't get it, get you anywhere, Amen. right? And, and the only righteousness that God recognizes is the righteousness of his son Amen. that he sent on earth to die for the sins of the human race. And so <clears throat> that's really verses chapters 1 through 3. And then in chapter 4, it gets into the fact of justification by faith, meaning that when you put your faith in Christ... He was your substitute sacrifice. He was a substitution for you. The Bible teaches this from the beginning of after the fall all the way through that God had a plan of substitution. He offered uh, skins for Adam and Eve in the garden and the skins that came came from an animal, but the thing is is that that animal had nothing to do with Adam and Eve's sin. It was an innocent animal, which was a type of Jesus who would be our substitute sacrifice. Amen? Then in Romans chapter 5, he explains a few different things. Number one, he starts off by saying, because of our faith, because we've been justified, which means been declared innocent by God now because we put faith in Christ, that now we have access to grace. We have access into the presence of God. I was sharing with somebody last night. I don't even remember where it was. But the word is entree. I was at Waffle House. I was talking to somebody. We were having a conversation across Waffle House talking about the Lord. The, the word It's an old French word, entree. It means that you've been given access, ushered into the presence of God. When you put faith in Christ and what he did for you at the cross, amen, now the Holy Spirit moves on your behalf. The door is open open for you to have access to the presence of God. But in Romans 5, it also talks about the fact that because of one man's sin, the entirety of the human race born of Adam was born in sin, but that through one man's act of obedience, the, the, there's now righteousness made available for all. Amen? Amen. All right. Then, but in Romans 6, he talks about the fact that we're going to talk about that this morning, about being baptized into Christ about being baptized into his death 
and baptized into his resurrection. The difference between Romans 6 and Romans 4 is Romans 4 talks about justification. It talks about the fact that Jesus is our substitute. Romans 6 talks about our identification. What does that mean? You learn to identify yourself with Jesus. You start to see yourself the way that God sees you. What does that mean? It means you start to realize that the old man that was born of Adam, he isn't alive anymore. Amen. The old man that was born of Adam now has died with Jesus. He became one with him through faith. Amen. And in that faith, the old man that was born of Adam died with Jesus at the cross, was buried with Jesus in the tomb. And just as Jesus was resurrected to newness of life, we too should walk in newness of life. Now, there's a few other chapters, but we've got to move on and get to Romans chapter 10. Romans 9 through 11 speak about Israel. God uses Israel as an example for to show us, to remind us, Paul actually says they were used as examples or in samples, the old King James Version, for us to, to realize the, the plan of God and really for the purpose that we wouldn't make the same mistakes that they made. All right. And so I want you to keep that in mind whenever we get into Romans chapter 10 and we start to read these verses that it's talking about Israel as the example of, of who they were, where they were, and that Paul has a Paul being born a Jew uh, was very concerned about their spiritual condition. But this is also being written so that you and I don't make the same mistakes <laughs> in verses one through four, four. The apostle Paul says, brethren, my heart's desire in prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So just because they knew God in the Old Testament. Just because God was with them and gave them direction, a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, just because they had God's word and law with them and they knew God doesn't mean that they're saved. The Apostle Paul makes it clear because, see, the nation as a whole rejected Jesus. And Jesus was the fulfillment of all that Old Testament law, all that Old Testament tabernacle, all those Old Testament sacrifices. He says that they might be saved for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. In other words, he's saying they're full of zeal. They're on fire. They think they, they know that they have the right way, but but they but they don't have the right way. And so their zeal is based on a improper knowledge. Have you ever met anybody like that before? Where they just they just know that. I mean, they're so passionate about what it is that they believe. But really and truly, what they believe is not really founded on the truth, right? It says, for they being ignorant, and this is what they were ignorant of, God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. You know, that was one of the main points also of the law. The law had many purposes. Once again, in that conversation I was having yesterday, we talked about the fact that the law describes God's character. The law reveals God's character to man. It shows mankind what God looks like. It's who he is internally. But he gave the law to man first, yes, to reveal himself to man at that point in time in human history. But also a part of it was to reveal to man that he couldn't keep the law. That man was incapable in his own strength to produce his own righteousness, to live his life in such a way that it would be pleasing to God. Because the scripture says in multiple places that the person that's going to live according to the law must live according to the law. In other words, you can't just pick and choose when you're going to live according to the law. You have to keep the law each and every day, every day for the rest of your life. And newsflash, that ain't going to happen. There's not one of us in this room that can keep God's law and never break it. Jesus was the only one that was able to keep the law of the Father to perfection. And then he offered up that perfect life as a sacrifice for our sin. Now, one of the problems that, so this is the, one of the problems that Israel had. They really were deceived into thinking that they were keeping God's law. What I mean by that is, 
there's, there's a, this is the only way I can describe it. I mean, I've never been a Jewish man, so I can't really tell you with certainty. But based upon the scriptures, I can understand that a certain level of deception came into their hearts and minds. And they felt like they were keeping enough of the law. Even though the scripture said, no, you got to keep the whole thing. They felt like they were keeping enough of the law, at least in comparison to what other people were doing. When they compared themselves to Gentiles who didn't even have the law. They, and they felt pretty good about themselves. Well, you can run into people still today who don't understand the gospel, who don't understand anything about the Bible. And you can try to talk to them about the Bible. And they're thinking, I'm doing pretty good. I don't understand what I need to be saved from. I don't understand what I need to. I've never killed anybody. I've never stolen anything. I don't even lie. But the reality of it is, is that they don't understand that according to God's standard of righteousness, they were born in sin. They were born of Adam and they need a savior. They're deceived just like Old Testament Israel in a certain. It's not exactly the same, but it's a similar kind of finding that man in and of himself cannot be pleasing in the eyes of God. That's the whole reason. Amen. That Jesus is came, that Jesus came to die for us. So instead, it would take man can't work good things in order to be pleasing to God. Therefore, it was going to take the work of God in order to make man righteous. Let's take a look at verses five through seven. It says, for Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. See, there, there's the example right there of what I was talking about, that if you're going to live according to the law, you have to live according to the law. That the man which does these things shall live by them. But the righteousness is, which is of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ again from the dead. Now, I don't know if you've ever wondered what exactly does that mean, but uh, I've always, I always wanted to study that to make sure that I, understand, that I understand what Paul's talking about. He's actually quoting out of Deuteronomy. He's quoting out of Deuteronomy chapter 31 when Moses was talking to the children of Israel. And he was letting them know that the word of God was near them, that the law of God was near them. And what Moses said was, you don't have to bring it down from heaven. Why? Because God already gave it to them. He gave it to them through Moses and the Ten Commandments. The word of the Lord was near them. They didn't have to cross over the sea to go get it because the word of the Lord, the law of God, was with them on this side of the sea. Now, as God had delivered them out from Egyptian bondage. Now, the apostle Paul is taking this passage of scripture and he's utilizing it for New Testament saints. He's saying, you don't have to talk about going get it in, up in heaven because God the Father already sent it down to you. The eternal word became flesh according to John 1 14 and dwelled amongst us. The word of God came from heaven just like the manna that came from heaven and dwelt upon the earth and was with mankind. You don't have to go down in the deep to get it because Jesus already resurrected from the dead. He was victorious over death, hell and the grave. Amen. And he's resurrected from the dead. The word of the Lord Lord is near you. Why? Because the presence of God, hallelujah, is moving and operating upon the earth and he's revealing to mankind in the heart of man what Jesus has done, what God the Father is doing through Jesus. He wants you to know. He wants your parents to know. He wants your family to know. He wants your friends to know what God is doing upon this earth. Amen. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. But what saith it? The word is near to you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach that if you shall confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now, I think it's important. And I know that I've talked about this many times before. But I think it's important that we understand that it's believing with the heart. It's not just believing with the head. You can talk to a lot of people and, you know, as a matter of fact, if you look, 
the most recent Gallup polls, I haven't looked at one lately, but it's somebody that has a service of taking polls. How many people in America would call themselves Christians? 85% of Americans would call themselves Christians at the last poll that was taken, that I know of. But the problem is, is that those 85% of people that are calling themselves Christians are not really desiring to live their life the way the Bible talks about. What they have heard was that their parents were Christians and that because their parents are Christians, that's what they identify with. But they haven't necessarily believed in their heart. They believe in their head, maybe. They might have even gone to catechism or gone to Bible school vacation Bible school, they might even believe in their head that there was a man named Jesus, a Jewish man that, that 2,000 years ago was 33 and a half years old and died on two pieces of wood and died for the sins of mankind, but they haven't truly believed in their heart. See, something different happens when the word of the Lord goes forth and the Holy Spirit through that word touches the heart and then the heart is given the opportunity to respond by faith and when that heart responds by faith that confesses with the mouth that Jesus Christ is indeed Lord, that he is indeed the answer for sin. Now the human soul, amen, is saved. Praise God. You know, gowdy has been texting me almost every week and he's saying 30 more got saved in Tampico at the hospital. The other day last night I was working on my message yesterday. He's like 20 more got saved in Tampico. I think since he and I left Tampico, it's, I think it's like 37, 30, 67, something like uh, 87 people maybe have gotten saved since. And then when we were there, it was like, uh, and, and so it's just happened. Well, what's happening is people are in need. People are in need and Brother Ramon is going over there and he's preaching the truth of the gospel. Yes. And when they hear it, you don't have to be in a hospital bed to be in need. Sometimes people, they're not necessarily in a hospital physically debilitated, but they're emotionally ravaged. They're spiritually ravaged. They're, 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 they're weakened by, the, by what life has done to them. And when they hear the truth of the gospel preached, Something happens on the inside of the heart. And it's because the Holy Spirit is moving behind the word that is spoken. And he's doing his part. And he's moving upon their hearts in order to receive by faith the truth. Amen. It says right here, verses 11 through 17. For the scripture says, whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. Now, I can't tell you that on this earth. That there won't ever be times that man, that the devil won't try to shame you through man, especially if you're young. I'm going to tell you right now, some of you young people in here, I can remember one time when I first got saved, boy, look, I was, oh man, I remember I had that old long hair and I was like wanting to be some rock and roll star and I remember I was riding this BMX bike, I hate to admit it, but it was stolen and uh, you know, I was just like a mess, man. And I'm riding down the road and I had gone to treatment. I had gone to treatment for the because of the mess that I was in. And every time I was locked up somewhere, if I was in detention home, it didn't matter. If I was in some rehab, it didn't matter. Some Christian showed up over there with a Bible and was wanting to talk about Jesus. And my sister Debbie's over here going to Twin City and the whole church is over here praying, save his soul, Lord. Get, send somebody to tell him about Jesus. And sure enough, every time I was somewhere where I'd be locked up and couldn't run away, Amen. the Lord would send somebody there to talk to me about him, Jesus. And every time, I, my heart would get a little bit softer. A yeah. little bit softer towards the things of God. And Lord, when they'd come, I'd want to hear. And there were some Baptist people that showed up over there at that, at that place where I was in Baton Rouge. And, and, and just kept talking about Jesus. And I can remember thinking to myself while I was there, it's like, why don't I live for the Lord? I believe He's real. I've always believed He's real. I just need to live for Jesus. Boy, and I had it in my head, I was going to live for Jesus when I got home. And I can remember I was still on that old stolen BMX bike riding down the road. And I had one of my friends from, he was from New York City. And we were just sitting there riding and we were getting ready to go get into some mischief. And I said, hey man, you ever thought about Jesus? He looked at me like, dude, Jesus? And he made this thing, and you know what? I just shut up after that, and I just kind of kept it all to myself. And I went about my business because you know what? The, the, the world and the enemy through the world will try to shame you into thinking that you don't want to live for the Lord. But I'm here to tell you, God is real. Jesus is real. And there's a world out there that's hurting, amen, and they need to hear the truth of the gospel. Amen. Lord, I pray that you fill us up with your power. 
fill us up with your spirit that we'd be strong enough to take a stand in the face of the world that we would not be so concerned about our reputation or how we look to other people that we wouldn't be so concerned to look cool to the world around us that we can't take a stand for Jesus, amen, after him, after he has taken a stand for us. Praise God. The scripture says you're not going to be ashamed. What are you talking about? People trying to clown me all the time for being a Christian. He didn't say you weren't going to. He's talking about in the end, you will not be ashamed. If you throw your lot in with Jesus today, if you connect yourself through faith to what he's done, in the end, there's going to be no shame for you because the truth is going to come forth in the end. Amen? Amen. Praise God. He says, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Now, the word Greek there is another way. Another word to be used instead of Gentile, another word to be used instead of heathen, is talking about those that don't know God. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now this is the part I like right here. It says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? In other words, how are they going to call on his name if they've never believed in him? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How are they going to hear? If, if everybody's so worried about being ashamed by the world, the question is, how in the world are they going to hear? How's your friends going to hear? How, how are your family members going to hear? I mean, it's a good question to ask. But how are they going to hear if we're, if we're never willing to come out and say it? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I started all that off yesterday with that one verse in my mind. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I couldn't just pull that one little verse out. I had to go back and do almost the whole chapter to come to the realization of really what I wanted you to hear in the first part of this message that I was preaching about water baptism. Is that there's a process that has to take place. Take place. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In order for faith to be stirred up, the word of God must be brought forth. The, the vibration, the sound of the gospel must be brought forth in human language for the human ears to be able to hear it. And whenever the human ears begin to hear the truth of the gospel, or whether it be human ears or seen some way, the heart, the mind must be told about the good news of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit begins to deal with the heart of man. Amen? Amen. We need preachers. Not just preachers that stand behind the pulpit. That's one of the things that I believe about uh, that's different about this church. Is that we, we, you know what, we believe in evangelism. We believe in it. And yes, you know, I need to get back with the mayor again. It's getting close to September. You know, sometimes you get tired and you feel like, oh, maybe we'll take this year off. But I know if I take this year off, I'll probably never do it again. So guess what? I'm going to get some more tracks. And even if I'm by myself, I'm going to go stand out there and I'm going to hand out some tracks. Amen. Bridget says, I'm with you, bro. All right. So we believe in evangelism. We believe in, I believe in that. I believe in street evangelism. And the good news is I don't expect you to come out there if you don't feel comfortable with that. And I mean that with all my heart. I want you to only do what you feel comfortable doing. You know what I'm saying? And at some point in time, if the Lord ever leads you to do that, fine. Then guess what? Come on, let's go do it. But I will tell you this. You shouldn't feel comfortable never talking about the gospel. That's right. That's right. And I have been in churches before that I've gone to. That when the preacher starts talking about personal evangelism, everybody gets all tight in their seat. They start squiggling and worming around because they don't feel comfortable. But I'm here to tell you the truth, that you have a testimony on the inside of you. If you have gotten saved and the Holy Ghost lives in your heart, you have a testimony on the inside of you. And there's a dying world out there that needs to hear the good news about Jesus Christ. Amen. How will they believe on him of whom they have not heard? Unless they get a preacher. Amen. And it's not just the preacher, once again, that stands behind the pulpit. But it's the preacher that lives in everyone's, in, on the inside of every one of you. Amen. A preacher is just a proclaimer of the truth. Amen. 
And God will open doors, whether it be on the workplace, whether it be in Walmart, whether it be with old friends that you used to know, whether it be on the school ground. You know the cool thing is what I always like to see whenever young people get on fire for the Lord? That's the best thing that you can ever imagine. Because see, in America, they, they can't stop students from doing things that students desire to Praise do. God. It's one of the awesome things. Whenever they keep asking me to go back, whenever I got that guy, Matt, to come preach for me, I heard he did a really good job. Amen. It was only his third time preaching. When I got Matt to come preach for me on Wednesday night, it was because the students at Fletcher that I, that I, uh, that I instruct, they keep asking me to do their, their class prayer when they do their ring ceremony as a nurse. Well, so they're the ones that are asking me to do it. I don't even know if they really know what they're getting into whenever they do that. But whenever they do, it's like I pre I, I, I'm able to preach the gospel. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm not going to keep them there for too long, but I'm like preaching the gospel. They had, they had one guy that was there. He was a, he was a professor that gave the uh, kind of like the ceremonial speech thing. Well, he was a United Pentecostal preacher. And he said, you know, my knowledge didn't explode until I gave my heart to Jesus. He said, I don't want to get too religious on you. And whenever I got up there, I said, well, they asked me to pray, so I'm about to get religious on you, you know. And, and I want you to, you know, and I was able to share with them the truth of the gospel and, and whatever the case. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that it's a beautiful thing whenever young people get on fire for the Lord because it gives them freedom and liberty. They don't realize that the enemy is trying to stifle us. He's trying to keep our mouths shut. But guess what? We still have rights in America that we can still tell the truth. Amen. And listen, this is my thing, and I'm not going to stop saying it. If they can talk about the things that they talk about around the water cooler at work, why can't I talk about Jesus? Amen. And so... And so I just want to encourage you that they will never know without a preacher. That's the first part of the message, really, because before you ever get to water baptism, you need to hear the truth. You need to hear the truth of the gospel, how Jesus died for you. Amen. And then when you believe in your heart and confess in your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. That you've been forgiven of your sins. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. And now you're saved. Amen. You're saved. Now, the second thing that I wanted to talk to you about, and we teach this a lot, comes out of Romans chapter 6. Because something happens spiritually when you get saved. When you hear the word of the gospel and you're, you believe by faith in the gospel, a miracle takes place on the inside of who you are. I didn't know this for the longest time as a Christian. Um, really, for 12 years of my Christianity, I had no clue of this. Little bits and pieces were, were told to me. Little scriptures were quoted. but And I'm not saying it was the preacher's fault. I didn't do my due diligence of studying the way that I should. Now, it always does help if you have a preacher that understands something to help teach you, right? But, but what ends up happening is, is that according to 2 Corinthians 5.17, actually, I want you to put that up there. 2 Corinthians 5.17, I didn't have it in my notes, but the miracle that takes place when the gospel goes forth, it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ. Now, when I first got saved, this is one of the first uh, passages that they preached to me after I got up from the altar on that day. But once again, I didn't really know what it meant. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What I need you to know is, is this, is that when the gospel goes forward and you receive it by faith, a miracle happens on the inside of your heart. We're about to talk to you about it a little bit more as you go back to Romans chapter 6 verse 1. And that there's a creative miracle that takes place. A creative miracle takes place on the inside of who you are, on the inside of your heart. In the mind of God, this is exactly what takes place. The old man that was born physically of Adam dies, and a new man that's born spiritually of Jesus is resurrected to newness of life. That's what God believes. Why? Because that's God's word. God stands by his word. It's his word. He believes it to be so. The problem that he has with you and I is, is that we don't line up our belief with his belief most times. Either number one, because we didn't know it, or number two, 
we just have a hard time wrapping our minds around it, or sometimes we just don't want to believe it. All right, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So we talked about this before many times, um, but and I don't mean to, to overdo it. But the word sin there is used 19 times. And right here it's used as a noun. So it's talking about the root instead of the fruit. What are you talking about? Well, I mean, the fruit of sin is all the things that you do. The action words of sin, whatever they may be. You can just fill in the blank. Whatever it is that you've struggled with in the past, the verb of sin are the actions that are manifest outside of our body, from our members, our hands, our eyes, our ears, our, you know, whatever, whatever it is that we touch and think about or whatever the case. The root of sin, though, is really like what we're born from Adam with. It's the, it's the compel, the, it's what compels us to, to engage in those action words of sin, right? It's what we receive from our father Adam. It's the, it's the sinful nature is what the apostle Paul called it. The old man's nature that was bound by sin. And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. Shall we, continue, shall we continue in this relationship with the sinful nature so that grace may abound? He had said it earlier. We're not going to go back to it. But where, where there was sin, there was more grace. And so now the question is, okay, so should we continue to live that way so that we get more grace? No, God forbid. Why? Because we that are dead to sin shouldn't continue to live where the root of sin is ruling and reigning in our lives and driving us like a slave to do the thing that we know that we're not supposed to do. That's basically what he's saying. Uh, you know, that, and a large part of the gospel teaches us that sin is in opposition to God. It stands in the way between man's relationship with God. Amen? And once again, I talked to you earlier when I was talking about the outline of Romans in chapter four, it talked about substitution. The fact that Jesus was your substitute sacrifice. But in Romans six is talking about identification. You seeing yourself one with Jesus, you seeing yourself one with him in his death, you seeing yourself one with him in his burial, you seeing yourself one with him in his resurrection. He goes on to say in verses three through four, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, one of the things that I wanted you to see here is that the word baptism is used. I've been in churches before where they use this passage of scripture to describe water baptism. But the word water is not in the text here. And so that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about water baptism. I'm not trying to do a lesson on Greek words. But what I will say is that the word baptism in the Greek language is different than the way we understand baptism. I know I'm losing y'all. I'm getting too technical. No? Okay. What do you think when you think baptism? Water. Water. Okay, can I get a kid to say that? Young person. Y'all pay attention. What, is, what do you think when you hear baptism? Can you say water? Come on, you can do it. Say water. Thank you. Water. Now you ought to be thinking of water because we're about to go get water baptized. But that's not what the meaning in the Greek was. The meaning in the Greek was... That you became one with it. Okay, I'm going to use a big word called transpose. What does that mean? Well, it's like nowadays you can have like a picture of something and you can take on the computer. You can, well, I tell you what, you can transpose. Not that I'm all about this because it looks weird to me whenever these kids put cat faces on their face on the picture. I don't, I don't, huh? It, Jessica said it's demonic. It does look pretty weird. I'll tell you that. But what I, but what I will say is this. 
That's what they're doing. They're transposing kitty cat ears, nose, and mouth onto a face. Transpose. The transposition is, is that the kitty cat facial features are becoming one with the face that's on there. That's really kind of the idea of the Greek baptism is a transposition of becoming one with. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Of becoming one with something else. So what the Apostle Paul is talking about right here is the fact that the old man born of Adam, when he puts faith in Christ, in the mind of God, in the spiritual realm, the old man is dying and he's becoming one with Jesus at the cross. He's becoming one with Jesus in the tomb. He's becoming one with Jesus in his resurrection to newness of life. Amen? Now, the thing of it is, is that water baptism perfectly represents what we're talking about because if you're in the trough and you're in water, and I know I did this the other day, but I'm going to do it again. If you're in the trough and you're in water and all of a sudden you go back into the water, now you're becoming one with the water. The old man is now being buried under the water. Got his finger on his nose so he doesn't drown. And then he's coming up to newness of life. He's being resurrected to a new life. Amen. So the water represents the grave. It represents the tomb. But that's a physical representation of something that's already taken place spiritually. When did it happen spiritually? When the preacher showed up at your house and he told you about Jesus. Now I'm not talking about the preacher behind the pulpit. I'm talking about your friend. I'm talking about your neighbor. I'm talking about your sister back when you were over there riding that stolen BMX bike and she kept trying to tell you about Jesus and finally when it really clicked and it really hit because you were at the end of yourself emotionally distraught just like a spiritual hospital and you needed Jesus and you heard the gospel amen and you responded by faith hallelujah in the spiritual realm whether you knew it or not that's what happened in the mind of God the old man born of Adam dies with Jesus identification transposition of becoming one with amen just as the body becomes one with the water in death you became one with Jesus in his death I hope that makes sense amen, amen? I can't do no better than that. That's right. Amen. 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 Thank you, sister. <laughs> Great illustration. Praise God. All right. So once again, many people confusingly preach this as water baptism, but the word water is not there. Now, it goes on to say in verses 5 through 6, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. Once again, in the Greek language, we're not going to get all technical here, but the idea is a union. You were planted together with. The word, the word has like S-Y-N as a prefix, which is where we get the word synonym, which means synonymously, which means to be the same as. The, just as he was planted, we were planted with him. Synonymously, we became one with him. We're still talking about identification. I see myself together with Jesus planted in the earth the old man buried brother Larson says it a lot less technical he says that once you once you kill something once something is dead and you bury it you don't go dig it back up to play with it right <laughs> he says when Fifi the cat dies and you bury her you don't go dig her back up to play with her because she's starting to stink after a period of time Right. So the old man is buried and, and, and dead with Christ. Amen. He says, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, that old person born of Adam, that old man born in sin, that old man that was corrupt in his nature, that our old man is crucified with him. Why? So that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now, it's important that we understand that it doesn't mean that the sinful nature is completely eradicated when you get saved. The idea behind it is, though, is that it's supposed, the relationship is supposed to be severed. It's kind of like a divorcement. That you've been divorced from the sinful nature. It's still alive. I mean, I, I've used this example before. I used to have a girlfriend a long time ago. And 
the last I heard, she's still alive. And I'm still alive. But the relationship between us is dead. The problem is, is that if you start getting on Facebook and you start messaging that old girl and you're like, hey, what you been up to? What's been happening? How you been doing? You know, and then she's messaging you back. The, the, what's going to end up happening is, is that all of a sudden that thing can come back to life. The same thing goes for the sinful nature, the power of sin, the power, the root that's behind the fruit. OK, if you allow yourself to play around with it long enough the power of sin can re regain dominion in your life and it can become, again, your master. And the next thing you know, you're starting to serve it again. And that's what it says right there, that we should not serve sin. The word serve there in, in the Greek language is do loss. And if you looked it up in a, King, a new King James Version, it wouldn't even say servant. It would say slave. It would say slave in the new King James Version. Because that's the idea behind it. That you're not supposed to be a slave to sin. We died with him and now we can live for him. As we continue to keep our faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit gives us grace, which is power from God, to live for him. And when we get water baptized, once again, it is the public declaration of what already happened spiritually when we believed. So when we go to get water baptized and we go under the water, we're now declaring to the world. That's why <coughs> I personally like getting baptized in late for Lord. Now I realize nowadays, you know, I don't know. We got a lot of, even Miss Jackie's or whatever making face. She's like, I ain't getting baptized in late for Lord. Right? <laughs> well, anyway, I got baptized in late for Lord. You know, the reason why I like that idea is not, I, I understand that the water's dirty or whatever, or people say it is. I don't know. People skiing it all the time. Anyway. The reason I like the idea of it is because it's I, like a public declaration. That's kind of why I like the idea of going out to Kemper Williams. I'm not saying there's going to be a big old crowd of people out there, but there's people in, in trailer, you know, RVs and stuff like that. It's, it's a way of you pronouncing publicly that you're giving your life, that you're going to live for the Lord. Amen. And I think that that's an important. I think that's an important thing. That's why it's important for church family, if you can make it. To be out there, amen, to support your, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, but also because it's a public declaration. So once again, I don't mean to belabor the point, that's what water baptism is. It's a public declaration, a physical illustration of something that's already taken place spiritually in the mind of God, in the heart of man, when you put your faith in Christ. You didn't even have to necessarily know this when you got saved. This is, I keep going back to this because I understand it so much better now. When I first got saved, and I know I've shared this with the church a lot of times, but it was almost like the, the weight of sin felt like it was cement sacks on my back. And when I got saved, it was like that cement fell off my back. Y'all remember what I'm talking about. Now, if you don't know how to walk with the Lord, you start trying to put your faith in what you do and your own works. You frustrate the grace of God. You find yourself falling back into a mess. Next thing you know, the weight of sin can be back on your back. But what I'm trying to say is that was the power of the cross. When you first got saved, that was the power of Calvary. You didn't know it, but that's what happened. The old man that you were died and, and he was forgiven. And in the mind of God, you were declared righteous. And that's how God saw you. And you felt the Holy Spirit move in and doing his work on the inside of your heart. And that's why you could feel that presence and that, yeah. that change was actually palpable <clears throat> in that moment of time. You could feel it. Amen? All right. Now I want to just give you a quick example of the process. We're just going to read this passage of Scripture, and really that's going to be it. We're going to head on out there. This is Acts chapter 8, verses 25 through 40. And we're just going to kind of read through, and, <clears throat> and we'll stop as needed. It says, and then, now this is the book of Acts, right? This is after, if you'll remember, in the beginning of the book of Acts, Jesus has resurrected from the dead. He tells his disciples, tarry for me in Jerusalem. You will be endued with power from on high, for you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. After they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we talked about that last weekend. They received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost, amen, to overflowing. They began to speak in other tongues. It was an evidence that they, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But then Peter stood up, remember that, and he preached. 
The first Holy Spirit filled message and 3,000 people got saved and were added to the church. Then just a couple of verses later, 5,000 people got saved and were added to the church. Then we read also in Acts chapter 2 that from that point moving forward that they were in one accord, that they spent time in fellowship with one another, breaking bread, which means they were taking communion with one another, and that they were holding steadfast to the apostles' doctrine. They were learning the scriptures. They were taking communion together. They were spending time in fellowship together. The church the church was growing, amen? And as people are filled with the Holy Spirit, as people are saved, listen, whenever God does something in your life, you talk about it. And the more you talk about it, the more people hear about it, the more people, amen, are wanting to, to, to come and, and, to, and to see the things of God, amen? It says, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And the angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, and the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. Now, you know, one of the things I like about this is that it's kind of like, okay, so the angel went to Philip and told him, Hey, you need to get up. So right here they are. This is... Uh, Sea of Galilee, Dead Sea, Jordan River, Samaria is somewhere around here. Gaza, the Gaza Strip is somewhere around here. It was one of the areas where the Philistines were. The angel of the Lord shows up over here to Philip and tells him he needs to come down here for a purpose. And it's kind of like, well, why don't the angel just go do it over there and do? Because see, God did not commission angels to preach this gospel message. Right. Angels don't know, can't preach the gospel message because angels don't know what it looks like or feels like to be saved. Angels that rebelled against God in ancient past never got another chance. The Bible says they look down upon this thing known as salvation. They peer over with and they contemplate everything that's going on as they see the gospel message. And at the same time, they're filled with joy when one more soul is saved. God sent this angel to be a messenger to Philip and said, hey, you need to get down here to this area right here. And he says that, that which is desert. And he arose and went and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship. I'm sorry, I got my map all wrong here. They went down from Jerusalem unto Gaza. So really and truly, they were preaching in Samaria here. Jerusalem is here. It says they went down to Gaza. The Lord talked to him there, talked to him there and told him to go back to Jerusalem. And so that's one more thing. This is just technical because I'm like a little nerd about this stuff. But why would you think if this is south and this is more north, north, uh, west, it says they went down? Why? Elevation. Uh, yes, elevation. Jerusalem was on a mountain. So when it says they're going down, that's important. I mean, whenever you're reading and you don't understand, you know what I'm saying? They went down. They went down in elevation, but then they went up north in, in, in ge geography. All right, whatever. So anyway, the, whole, the, the angel tells Philip that he needs to go and he needs to connect himself to this Ethiopian eunuch. Well, I want you to put up there Deuteronomy 23.1. Because see... This Ethiopian eunuch is a very powerful person. He's the treasurer of a queen's, all of her money. And this isn't just him by himself in the chariot. This, he's got, there's, I can guarantee you there's an entourage here. There's multiple servants. There's multiple chariots. Why did I put this up here? Because see, he's over there wanting to worship God. And this is the law. This is the Old Testament law. And it says... He that is wounded in the stones or has his privy member cut off shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. I tell you all the word in the Bible is at least PG-13. <laughs> when it's talking about stones there and it's talking about his privy member, it's talking about his private area. I mean, it just is what it is. He's a eunuch. What does that mean? It means he was castrated. It means that his stones, the way the King James put it, were removed. The reason that they did that was because in ancient times, whenever they had a man that was going to be in close 
uh, quarters with a bunch of women and they wanted to be able to trust them that if this person really wanted to serve to the fullest, he'd give his life for this situation and they would castrate him and make him a eunuch. So the problem, the point, the only reason I put this scripture up here is because what we're going to see is this is a man that wants to know God. But based upon the Old Testament law, he can only get so close to God. He can't really get into the temple of God. He can't get into the presence of God because his privy member is not right. And so he is restricted to where, how close he can get to the Lord. But yet at the same time, God sees his heart. God sees how much he desires to know the Lord. And God sends Philip over there to him. And so that's what it says. We're going back to Acts chapter uh, 8. And we're at the part where it says a eunuch of great authority <coughs> under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Acts chapter 8, maybe try around verse 30. I didn't have my verses. <coughs> All right. And it says that he, um, and he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join yourself to this chariot. And Philip ran there to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what you read now what I, what I, so what I want you to know is is that last week on on Wednesday night we talked about a, a proselyte y'all remember that word I don't know if you remember me saying that or not a proselyte Jewish person was a was a part like the centurion who had sent his servants to Peter's house he, they, they were people that wanted to serve the God of the Old Testament but they weren't Jewish born by heritage. This eunuch, in a sense, would have wanted to be a proselyte, but he couldn't really be a proselyte because of the fact of his situation that he was in. And so he was reading the Old Testament scriptures of the Jewish people. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. He was actually reading the part in Isaiah chapter 53, where it talks about the fact that he was wounded for our transgressions. Now, the thing that you have to know is, is this, is that Isaiah was written about 700 B.C. So that means that about 700 years before Jesus was ever born, the prophet Isaiah, through the Holy Spirit, was already writing these things about Jesus 700 years before he would ever be born. It says he was wounded for our transgressions. Like a lamb, he was led to slaughter, and he did not open his mouth. He quietly, humbly went to the cross. It says he bore our iniquities upon him. He, in other words, he took our sin. Amen? And so the, 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 the eunuch is reading the gospel message, and all of a sudden, as he's reading it, the Holy Spirit starts to deal with it. The Holy Spirit starts to deal with him and causes him to begin to ask questions. But, but he doesn't have answers. How will they believe on him of whom they have not heard? How can they hear unless they receive a preacher? One of the things that we have to understand is that God wants people to hear the gospel. Amen. I'm telling you, before the preacher would get up there and preach, if, you, if it, depending on the situation, if you felt like you had to ask him a question, he'd be, hold on a second, brother. Don't, don't mess with the anointing. You know, I got to get up there and preach. And later on, you know, I probably got the wrong attitude, but I was thinking to myself, dude, if I'm going to mess the anointing up that bad, I just wonder whether or not you really had it. The point that I'm trying to make is this, is that God wants the gospel to go forward. God, he, he's just using me as a vessel. I, he's just loaning me something that don't belong to me anyway. It all belongs to God. Amen. He's just saying, I just need you to be a willing vessel that I can fill myself up in to pour myself out of to tell the people the truth. How will they hear without a preacher? Amen. And so Philip goes and he connects himself to this eunuch and um, he asks him, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired that he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. 
The place of the scripture which you read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee. In other words, I'm asking you. I'm, in a way, I'm asking you. I'm begging you. I, I, I passionately asking you to, to tell me. Uh, he, he says, um, to tell me who does the prophet speak? Is he speaking of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Praise God. He was able to open up this man's eyes. He was able to open up and say, listen, this is what we've been waiting for. All those years that we felt like God was no longer hearing us. It was because of their own rebellion. But all those years where we felt like God was no longer hearing us. And all this time that we've been waiting. And he told us that Messiah was coming. And he told us that the promised one would be here. He came and his name was Jesus. And he was the lamb that was led to the slaughter. And he did not open his mouth. And he humbly went to the cross. And he bore the penalty of man's sin. And I'm here to tell you, Mr. Eunuch, I know that it's true. Hallelujah. Because I was in that upper room when the Holy Ghost. Well, I might not have been in the upper room when the Holy Ghost showed up. But after I got saved, hallelujah, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. I feel the presence of God on the inside of me. I'm here to tell you the truth of the gospel. Amen. And the next thing you know, the eunuch says this. It said, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, a water hole. And, what, and, and so the eunuch said, see, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. How did the eunuch know? Well, there were Old Testament baptisms and washings with waters and various things like that. But I mean, I personally believe, listen, by this time, the, the church is growing. Church is blowing and, and growing. Uh, you know, the Apostle Paul, you know, Stephen, the martyrs already died. The gospel's going in all kinds of different directions. Listen, there were people getting baptized left and right. In the, in the New Testament church, when people got saved, they got wet. You know, they didn't wait like a whole year in between like what we've been doing. It's like because people were being added to the church. When people are being added to the church, you can't wait a year. It'd take you two days to baptize all them people if you, if you did that. They, 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 when you got saved... Hey man, you got baptized. And so I believe that this eunuch had seen this happen before. And he realized what was going on. When he sees the water puddle, he's like, uh, you know, what's going to hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said, this is the only thing you need to know. If you've believed in your heart, amen, then you can be baptized. The Bible says that they got down and it says, uh, he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus. So really and truly, that was the majority of my message. I just wanted you to see that first it starts with the seed of the gospel. The gospel message has to go forward. And when the gospel message lands on a hungry heart and that heart by faith receives Jesus Christ, a miracle takes place in the spiritual realm. The old man that was born of Adam dies. He becomes one with Jesus in the tomb and the new man is resurrected to newness of life. And then when we're baptized in water, it's an outward illustration of what's already taken place inwardly. Amen. And another one is added to the kingdom of God. Praise God.